Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 90, Things are falling apart. Now I have to start with a correction. Last week I erroneously ascribed the quote from my cold dead hands to Clint Eastwood, though it was, as every child knows, Charlton Heston who said that. What makes this particularly embarrassing is that Clint Eastwood had been very vocal in his support for gun control since the 1970s, and I can only apologize unreservedly, and thanks to listener Gary for making me aware. Now this week, we will indeed see things falling apart. The never-ending war is exactly what it is, a never-ending, unwinnable war, against an enemy that hides on the other side of the Alps and cannot be attacked. Money is running low and Frederick II is getting concerned about the loyalty of his closest associates, and those he will lose, one due to the vagaries of war, the other through a bout of paranoia. Now before we start, just a reminder. The History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons, and you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash history of the Germans or on my website historyofthegermans.com you can find all the links in the show notes and thanks a lot to Chris M, Gaia and Curtis B who've already signed up. Last week we had left Frederick II in ever worsening frustration about the progress of his struggle with Pope Innocent IV. He had suffered a humiliating defeat before the walls of Parma his great new imperial capital of Victoria had been burned to the ground by the men, women and children of Parma. His most trusted adviser Tadeo da Suessa had been captured, tortured and had died in prison. The imperial crown, the one today displayed in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, had fallen to the enemy, had been paraded through the city streets in a carnival procession. The soldier who took it sold it to the town for 200 pounds of silver and a small house next to the church of Santa Cristina, so that for an undisclosed time thereafter it was kept in the sacristy of the Cathedral of Parma. Salimbene reports that the merchants from far and wide came to Parma to buy up the gold and silver vassals, the precious stones and cloth of gold for pittance. That's how the Emperor's own copy of the Book of Falconry ended in the stock of a Milanese merchant in 1268, before vanishing forever. What was almost a miracle was that Parma failed to trigger the domino effect the Guelphs had hoped for. None of the major cities went across to the other side in the immediate aftermath of Parma. He may have seen this as a sign of the unwavering loyalty of his communal allies, but it is more likely to be nothing more than the continued animosity between Guelphs and Ghibelline factions that is now largely detached from the fight between Pope and Emperor that had kicked it off in the first place. Parma was nevertheless a massive blow to the imperial finances. The city of Victoria had held the imperial treasury, recently enlarged by the significant Babenberger funds. But all that had now been lost. Frederick had to again put a special tax on his Sicilian subjects, subjects who had almost rebelled two years earlier. Because remember, Sicily had taken the imperial deal which was a deal that says you get peace and justice in exchange for obedience. They had accepted the loss of freedom of speech, the freedom to worship and the freedom to associate into communes, but they drew the line when it came to their wallets. What had made things particularly irksome was that tax collection had been privatized. Tax farmers promised the emperor a fixed amount in exchange to charge his subjects whatever he can squeeze out of them. That meant taxation was not only a much heavier burden than necessary, but it was also grossly unfair. Frederick must have known that this was not sustainable, but at the same time, he could not give up. A one-sided end of hostilities would have brought the whole network of alliances to its collapse, and it would have allowed the Pope to finally recruit what he called a true athlete of Christ, who would remove Frederick as emperor and as king of Sicily. Politically, Innocent's position had improved when King Louis of France finally left for his crusade in 1248. Until then, Louis had undermined Innocent's plan for a crusade against Frederick 
because Louis wanted all crusading efforts to focus on the Holy Land, where Jerusalem had fallen to the Turks in 1244. Do I need to mention that St. Louis' crusade was a catastrophic failure? Well, not really. I guess you know the drill, though this really is déjà vu all over again. Because St. Louis is a pious king, and so he does things properly. He took his army to Damietta and he captured Damietta. The Sultan of Egypt offers peace with concessions and Louis, being a true crusader, rejects them all. Then he moves on to Cairo, this time hoping not for Prester John to help, but for the Mongols. Yes, the Mongols. The same Mongols who'd been putting the fear of God, or the fear of agile horsemen, into anyone living east of the Rhine. Just to give you an idea how deluded the papacy and the crusaders have become, here is a fun little story. In April 1245, Pope Innocent IV sent two Franciscan friars to the court of the great Khan in Karakorum with a letter. In this letter he enlightened the Khan about the errors of his ways. He admonished him to get baptized in the Catholic faith and to recognize him as the true vicar of Christ. The great Khan Gug's response conveys this befuddlement with a papal proposition. Quote, How do you think you know whom God will absolve and whose favor he will exercise his mercy? How do you think you know that you dare to express such an opinion? Unquote. And then he concludes with, quote, You personally, at the head of the kings, you shall come, one and all, to pay homage to me and serve me. Then, we shall take note of your submission. If, however, you do not accept God's order and act against our command, we shall know that you are enemies. End quote. Unperturbed by this response, Innocent sends further missions, and for the same reason, the Crusaders believe the Mongols are going to coordinate their attacks with their efforts in Egypt. Well, they did not. The Crusaders get up to exactly the same spot the Fifth Crusade had perished and, drumroll, did win the battle there. But then the inevitable happens. The honorable chivalric knights run into a trap laid by wily Egyptian commanders. The Crusaders were beaten comprehensively, so comprehensively that the whole army, including King Louis, was captured. One year, 800,000 Byzantine gold coins and the return of Damietta later, King Louis is released. Louis will stay in the Holy Land for another four years, achieving precisely nothing. With Louis out of the picture, Innocent gains room to maneuver. He puts up a new anti-king to replace the luckless Heinrich Raspe. This athlete of Christ is Count William of Holland. This count has even less traction than the much more powerful Landgraf. It takes him a year to get into Aachen to get crowned, but after that he returns back to Holland to fight some of his neighbors on the polders. His luck will improve later, but by 1248 he is no real threat to Frederick II or his son Conrad IV. Now Innocent is also on the lookout for a second champion, the one who is supposed to take over the crown of Sicily. He talks to many, amongst them the two most ambitious men in 13th century Europe, both younger brothers of kings. The first is Richard of Cornwall, brother of Henry III of England. Richard has become a major player in the convoluted politics of England at the time, usually supportive of his brother but sometimes also siding with the barons. This game of back and forth had made him one of the richest landowners in England and the Count of Poitiers. He does know Sicily well, having visited his sister, the beautiful Isabella, who had been married to Frederick II. He was also an accomplished soldier, who had headed up the last partially successful crusade to the Holy Land in the early 1240s. But Richard turned Innocent down, claiming obligations under the still formally existing alliance between England and the Empire. And as with William of Holland, this is not the last we will hear from Richard of Cornwall. The other ambitious man was Charles of Anjou, younger brother of King Louis of France. He too was carving out his little empire. He had set his eyes on Provence, specifically on Beatrice of Provence, so beautiful she set men's hearts thumping and the fingers of troubadours to fevered twanging of lyres. 
Beatrice was the daughter and heiress to Count Ramon Berengar IV of Provence. Provence was at that time part of the Kingdom of Burgundy and hence part of the Empire. Its counts were from the family of the Counts of Barcelona, who had by now risen to Kings of Aragon. So when Ramon Berengar IV died in 1245, King James I of Aragon immediately occupied the county and seeking to marry Beatrice himself. Now Beatrice hid in her castle at Aix-en-Provence and asked, who else but our favorite Pope, Innocent IV, for help? Meanwhile, a number of other suitors were setting out for the land of olives, wines and troubadours. These included Count Raymond VII of Toulouse and, it seems, Frederick II himself. In such a crowded field, the younger son of the King of France needs a powerful sponsor. That sponsor is... Da, 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 our favorite Pope, Innocent IV. Innocent uses Provence as leverage to stop Louis to be overly supportive of Frederick, and bang, the lovely Beatrice and her even lovelier inheritance goes to Charles of Anjou. So Charles owed Innocent big time, but still, Charles too turns him down in 1248 when he's asked to contest the crown of Sicily. Officially, because he was going on that ill-fated crusade of his brothers. And again, this is not the last we hear about Charles of Anjou. Hence in 1248 there was no rival monarch for Sicily and the pretender north of the Alps was a non-entity. But that in itself is not making things great. Frederick II was 54 years old and he was increasingly alone in his frustration. Not only had Tadeo da Suessa passed away, so had the love of his life, Bianca Lancia. Many of his closest advisers and fellow members of his poet society had turned against him in 1246. At this point he only trusts his immediate family members. His illegitimate sons, Enzio and Frederick of Antioch, are replacing members of his court as imperial vicars, responsible for military operations. By the end of 1248, he began losing confidence in one of his longest standing and most important advisers. Pietro da Venea had joined the imperial chancery way back in the 1220s and had raised up the career ladder. By 1224 he was already a judge at the high court. In 1230-31 he was one of the authors of the Constitutions of Melfi. In 1243 he was called the Imperialis Aule Protonotarius et Regno Sicilia Logo Teta so a proto-notary. As such, he's producing the Latin announcements of the emperor, and as we've heard before, was the brains behind the imperial propaganda machine after the excommunication in 1239. His elaborate style of Latin became the benchmark for future chancellors all across Europe. And as Logotate, a Byzantine title, he was the actual voice of the emperor. On many of the great occasions, when the imperial honour is presented to the people, Frederick would not speak himself, but sit motionless on a throne, wearing his crown and projecting the majesty of the ruler, whilst it was Pietro da Venere who would speak on his behalf. Between 1234 and 39, Frederick had a monumental gate constructed in Capua. This enormous gate formed the grand entrance into the kingdom of Sicily when he came from the papal lands. It had a lot in common with ancient Roman triumphal arches and was to symbolize the political program of Frederick II and his kingdom. He is shown in the guise of an ancient Roman emperor, the first time such iconography had been seen in Western Europe since the fall of the empire. The message was that he has the power to provide peace and justice, the Pax Romana. And justice is made manifest through three tondi just above the entrance to the kingdom, showing a female head of justice in the middle and two judges. One was clearly Pietro da Venere and the other either Tadeo da Suessa or Giacomo da Moro, the former loyal to the end, the latter a conspirator in 1246. Few things indicate how much Pietro da Venere was at the heart of the concept of the state that Frederick II had built. And this heart is about to be torn out. We do not know what exactly happened. But by the end of 1248, Frederick had become convinced that Pietro da Venere was betraying him. 
being at the heart of the financial, legal and political system of the empire and the kingdom of Sicily, had made Pietro da Venea immensely rich. Unsurprisingly, that created envy and fueled rumours of his corruption. But during this time, it would have been most unusual for a man in his position not to amass a fortune. Kings and emperors were expected to be generous with their closest advisers, and diplomacy involved expensive gifts given to intermediaries. Now, the accusation that Frederick will bring forward in February 1249 is that Vinea had begun secret negotiations with the Pope. Frederick had ordered that da Suessa and Vinea should always negotiate with Innocent IV together. Neither, he said, should be allowed to have any conversation with the Pope on their own. He did not accuse Vinea of having made any specific arrangements with his enemy, but that he had spoken to Innocent alone and unsupervised. And that was enough. Matthew Paris, always good for a bit of salacious gossip, reports that Vinea had bribed the royal physician to poison Frederick, all on the behest of the Pope. Paper propaganda takes a slightly different tack. It blames the fall of Vinea on imperial money problems. According to them, Frederick had run out of other financing options and needed the wealth of his closest advisor to keep going. Now, whatever the actual reason, Frederick ordered Venere to be blinded and paraded across Italian cities pour encourager les autres. Pietro was not the kind of man who could bear such treatment. In April 1249, guards found Pietro da Venere lifeless in his cell in the Casa San Miniato near Florence. He had smashed his hat in on the column they had chained him to. Dante encounters Pietro da Venere in the seventh circle of hell, where he has been turned into a gnarly, dusky tree covered in poisonous thorns and picked at by harpies. He is in the wood of suicides, where men go have thrown away their earthly bodies, forsaking their rights to have human form in the afterlife, at least according to Dante. On the question of his culpability, Dante let Venere say the following. By the strange roots of this tree, I swear to you, I never broke faith with my lord, so worthy of honour. If either of you return to the world, raise and cherish the memory of me that still lies low from the blow envy gave me. End quote. And that is my view too. Vinea was the victim of paranoia and court gossip. That is not the only disaster 1249 has in store for Frederick. There's the city of Jesi, where he had been born and which da Vinea had styled as the new Bethlehem in his propaganda that placed the emperor as the successor and vicar of Christ. Jesi had fallen to papal troops. And a mere month later comes the next blow. Frederick had handed military command in northern Italy to his oldest and favourite son, Enzio, the Falconello, so similar to his father in appearance and interests. Enzio had been occupied with a retaliatory expedition against Parma when he is called upon by the city of Modena, one of the Ghibelline allies who have to defend themselves against an attack by Bologna. Enzio races along the Via Emilia down to Modena. His exhausted troops encounter the army of Bologna at a creek called Fossalta on May 25, 1249. In the initial encounter, the imperial side is near defeated when nightfall stops fighting. The next morning, the main combat action begins. Now, as often in the warfare of this time, the battle is fought almost exclusively by knights on horseback who look for individual contests of strength to show their chivalric mettle. The encounter is turning into dozens and dozens of individual skirmishes, one man against another. Both sides are almost equally matched. What turns the battle is that Enzio is getting unhorsed in one of his duels. Seeing their leader fall and then the memory of the previous night's failure disheartens the Gelfs and they run. Nanzio is quickly back on a horse but he cannot stem the tide. The imperial troops splinter and find themselves lost in the maze of rivers, creeks and canals that crisscross the Po Valley. Enzio and his remaining troop of knights find themselves surrounded by Bolognese fighters and concede. For the Bolognese to capture Enzio, himself a king, even though only a king of Sardinia, but also the son of the emperor is a matter of enormous prestige. 
he and the other captives are led into a victorious city in a sumptuous parade. The citizens celebrate by hanging all their most valuable cloth out of the windows, put on their most sparkling jewels, the most shiny armor, as the mighty carroccio of the Republic of Bologna parades through the streets, followed by the captives in chains, the broken imperial standards, and finally, King Enzio himself, riding on his war horse and wearing his crowned helmet with his long blonde hair flowing to his waist. At the end of the great procession, Enzio is brought to the palace of the Podesta, where he is given a luxurious apartment, where he is held in honorable captivity. His father tries to get him out, using both threats and concessions. But even when offered a silver ring going all around the city of Bologna, the consuls of the Republic remain firm. They would not release Enzio, since he would be the hostage that forever binds the wild boar that is Frederick II. For the remaining 22 years of his life, Enzio will remain in this building that still stands and is known as the Palazzo de Re Enzio in the center of Bologna. Right in front of it rises the famous statue of Neptune by Gian Bologna, and if visitors get to look at Enzo's prison at all, it's because it houses the tourist office. The domino effect that had been feared finally kicks in. Como, forever an enemy of Milan, joins the League. The pass connecting Tuscany and Lombardy is taken and finally by the end of 1249 Modena, eternal enemy of Bologna, makes peace. No worries. Bologna and Modena will resume fighting a few years later and their enmity is so deep they would fight a war over the ownership of a bucket. Not a joke. The bucket can still be seen in the Cathedral of Modena. And let's not forget that Ferrari is based in Maranello, in the province of Modena, whilst their rivals, Lamborghini, are from Bologna. Modena going over to the league is a serious blow. By the end of 1249, Frederick is tired and exhausted. There are no details, but from this time onwards, he remains in Puglia, mainly in his favorite palace in Foggia. His health seems to be crumbling under the strain of a decade of warfare. He leaves the fighting to his generals, who are gradually being more successful. The citizens of Parma are being defeated, partially reversing the impact of the destruction of Victoria. He announced that he would travel to Germany and finally do the great show of unity with the princes, maybe even go to Lyon and force the Pope into an agreement. According to Matthew Paris, Frederick renews his offer to go to the Holy Land, return church property and even abdicate, this time for the benefit of his youngest son, Henry, from his marriage to Isabella of England. Here's how Matthew Paris describes the papal response. Quote, to these offers, however, the Pope obstinately persisted in the reply that he would on no account so easily restore to his former condition him whom the General Council of Lyon had deposed and condemned. By some, it was positively affirmed that the Pope eagerly desired above all things to overthrow Frederick whom he called the great dragon, in order that he being trampled underfoot and crushed, he might more easily then trample down the French and the English kings and the other kings of Christendom, all of whom he called petty princes and the little serpents, and who would be frightened by the case of the sad Frederick and might despoil them and their prelates of their property at his plea. These speeches, together with the enormous deeds which bore powerful evidence to the meaning of his words, generated offence in the hearts of many and strengthened the justice of Frederick's so that his cause began to improve daily. End quote. But it is all too late. On December 13, 1250, at the now disappeared town of Castel Fiorentina in Puglia, Frederick the greatest of earthly princes, the wonder of the world and the regulator of its proceedings, departed this life, wrote again Matthew Paris. On his last days he surrounded by his son Manfred, the Archbishop Berard of Palermo, who had been his constant supporter and adviser since he was a teenager, and the leader of his German knights, the great justice of Sicily and his personal physician. But neither of them left us with an eyewitness report of what had happened. And that leaves room for lots of stories. Salimbene di Pama, consistent to the last in his disapproval of the emperor, says 
he had died as worms grew out of his corrupted body, making his flesh fall off his bones under agonizing pain. The stench of his cadaver, he claims, had been so unbearable it could not be buried with the other kings of Sicily and Palermo. The fact that Frederick's body is indeed buried in Palermo makes this account a little less credible. But Salambene is not the only one on the papal side who has something to say about the manner of his death. The chronicler of the life of Innocent IV describes the emperor's death as follows. Suffering from horrific diarrhea, gnashing his teeth and foaming at the mouth, the emperor died under ear-splitting screams of agony, terrified of hell that awaited him, the excommunicate. Then there's Giovanni Villani, who let the emperor die in his bed, but not from natural causes. According to him, Manfred, his son by Bianca Lancia, had suffocated him with a cushion, as he feared his father was about to cut him out of his will. Now Matthew Paris paints a more typical death scene, the emperor feeling his end coming, making his last will and testament. Then he confesses his sins and takes on the habit of a Cistercian monk. Finally, his old friend and long-standing supporter, the Archbishop Berard of Palermo, releases him from the excommunication. In Matthew Paris, he dies a confessed sinner, a good death in the eyes of the Middle Ages. One of the few things many agree is that the death of the Empress kept a secret for several days as Manfred grabs the levers of the state in Sicily and informs his half-brother Conrad IV up in Germany about the demise of their father. News of his death are only circulated on December 26, exactly 56 years after his miraculous birth in the town square of Jesi. Meanwhile, his body has been transported to Palermo. As he had ordered, he was to be buried in a large ancient Roman sarcophagus made from porphyry, the most prized reddish marble. This sarcophagus had initially been destined for his grandfather Roger II, but Frederick had Roger put into another, still impressive tomb and reserved this one for himself. He lies next to his father Henry VI and his mother Constance in Palermo Cathedral. There had been an inscription on his sarcophagus that is now lost, which read, If honesty, if wisdom, intelligence and success, if noble conduct could hold back death, then Frederick, who lies in this spot, would have never died. Manfred wrote to his half-brother Conrad IV, Gone is the sun that shone above the people, gone is the beacon of justice, gone is the harbinger of peace. But great consolation is left to us, as he, our father, lived his life joyfully and victorious to the end. Frederick had ordered his affairs before he died. His imperial title and the kingdom of Sicily were to go to his son, Conrad IV, now a man in his thirties, an accomplished general and, other than his elder brother, an obedient son. Should Conrad IV die, the crowns should go to the youngest of his sons, Henry, from his marriage to Isabella of England. And finally, should Henry pass as well, his inheritance should go to Manfred, his son by Bianca Lancia, indicating that indeed Frederick had married her on her deathbed and legitimized their children. His grandson, the son of his unlucky eldest son, was to gain the duchies of Austria and Steiermark. So, at the end of December 1250, the picture for the dynasty is surely not rosy, but the imperial side is winning again and there are four legitimate Hohenstaufen heirs, let alone a brace of illegitimate ones. The empire north of the Alps is tightly managed by Conrad IV, Sicily is secured by Manfred as Conrad's viceroy. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we'll find out next week. I hope you will join us again. Now before I go, let me thank all of you who are supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have kindly signed up on patreon.com slash history of the Germans. It is thanks to you this show does not have to do advertising for products you do not want or hear about. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment or retweet a post from the History of the Germans, it's more likely to be seen by others, hence bring in more listeners. My most active places are Twitter, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links 
are in the show notes.